Bless us now as we preach, teach this message with power and authority. And may we not allow the enemy to mollify us. Glory to God. May we keep our fire. May we remain vigilant. May we stay on our post. Oh, God, give us strength to never be asleep at the wheel. Oh, Lord, touch us now. May we not be enticed by the world's goodies. May we not become unwise and allow our image, our likeness, or our influence to be used in a manner so as to be seen or understood as endorsing evil. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Thank God. Amen. The mollification of God's message. mollification of God's truth. Our text today is a very powerful story that illustrates one of the strategies that Satan is using to silence the voice of the church, to silence the voice of the servant of the Lord to silence the voice of the preacher. As a matter of fact, when attempts to intimidate and to censure and to injure or mislead in our text fail, I'm going to show you, Satan employed a different strategy. And the strategy was that of mollification, or he sought to mollify the preacher. If you, this is the ultimate, if you can't beat him, join him. Or if you can't beat him, get him to join you. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, Snoop Dogg understands mollification. He said concerning the uh, the legends of gospel and those that he wins to his causes or he gets them on his side, he says, you've been snoopified. The devil is in the business of snoopifying believers because we're not wise to his strategies. See, you are somebody in the kingdom of God. But you better know that you're somebody. And every believer is given the responsibility of not allowing their good to be evil spoken of. I'll never forget before I dive into this message, Louis Farrakhan came to Raleigh uh, a few years ago. And while in the city, Word was sent to yours truly that Louis Farrakhan wanted to meet with me. He did not suffer from having a tremendous lineup of African-American preachers who couldn't wait to shake the minister's hand and to be seen and to maybe to get a photograph with the minister. When the word was sent to me that he wanted to see me, I sent word back that that's not possible. 
But that won't happen. I'm God's man. I understood that all would be necessary to mollify me is for ju just one good photographer yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. to be there and just take the, the picture. What's that? Picture of a thousand words? Snapshot of a handshake. Now, we could be shaking hands saying, I vehemently disagree with you. But the point is, with the snapshot, you can make it look any way you want it. I didn't go because I'm responsible for where this image shows up. You don't hear me today. The devil wants to mollify um, the believer. To mollify in the strictest sense, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, is to crush. But it is actually to soothe the temper of, to, to pacify, to appease. To mollify is to make less intense or less severe. Amen. To mollify, synonyms for mollify uh, is uh, to placate, to sweeten, to assuage, to calm one's down, to soften one's tone. Or it is to, and there are various ways of doing this. Uh, one of the ways you do it is you could take advantage of using a person's likeness to end up being where you shouldn't be with the crowd that you shouldn't be with. Are you following me? So the goal of the devil is to get the preacher to be less preachy and to get us to go to sharing with you. My friends, I just come to share with you today. I didn't come to share. I come to preach. I'm a preacher. That's what I am. Sometimes our brashness is mistaken for arrogance. But it's not arrogance. It is a understanding that the world is trying to soften, soften us as it with brash and boldness proclaims its message. They want to shout at us and expect us to whisper back. To shout you down. Shut up, preacher. Or to put you in a position where you can't say anything because you've been mollified. Praise the Lord. Our text, I told you to preach, teach Sunday. It says in verse 1 of chapter 13 of 1 Kings, And behold, there came a man of God. This particular preacher is unnamed. But we know that he's a man of God because the text tells us. And... Um, he came out of Judah. God called the man of God out of the southern kingdom. Now where he came to was the northern kingdom. By now, Jeru Israel had been divided into two distinct kingdoms. Two distinct nations. Ten of the twelve tribes were under the leadership of a man named Jeroboam. The remaining two, called Judah, 
and that is the tribe of Benjamin, which made up the Levites, and uh, Benjamin and Jerusalem, the, 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 the two, were under the leadership of Solomon's son, King Rehoboam. Rehoboam, hear this, parents, parents, hear this, parents. Rehoboam, parents, were in trouble with God from day one, parents. Parents, you ought to say amen. amen. Why? Because of what Rehoboam's daddy did. His daddy was King Solomon. Solomon was David's son. The son that David had, the second child that Bathsheba gave birth to. The first child died. You know the circumstances, if you're a Bible student, of David and Bathsheba. Um, Rehoboam was, Solomon was, the legitimate heir. David got up off of his deathbed while he was sick with a condition where his body would not hold heat. He was dying and uh, he got up off of his deathbed and went and made sure that Solomon would be, would be heir to the throne. When Solomon got in, Solomon outsmarted himself because, saints, he would not hear God. This is a lesson to the nation. This is a lesson to us as a people. This is a lesson to the white man, to the black man, to the male, to the female. The Bible teaches that righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Sin will destroy your career. It will destroy your name. It will destroy your money. It will destroy your family. It will bring you down. The best thing that can be done with sin is for sin to be confessed and forsaken as fast as possible. Don't play with it. The Bible describes sin as a lion crouched at the door, set to pounce on you. Praise the Lord. Sin will pounce on you like Wilder got pounced on. Say amen. Sin. Y'all don't like me today. <laughs> Solomon, as wise as he was, made many strategic blunders. God appeared, if you study the Bible, to Solomon twice and told Solomon, whatever you want, just let me know. Solomon had an a open contract with God. The Lord blessed him with wisdom beyond any of his predecessors. Said to have been the wisest man to ever live. And even the wisest of men cannot outwit sin. So uh, this word is to the wise. This word is to the educated. This word is to the collegiate, this word is to the senior citizen, and it's to everybody all in between. Sin is your enemy. Sin is our enemy. And we're warned in the scripture, the Bible says, and be sure that your sins will find you out. Well, don't nobody know what I'm doing. Be sure that your sins will find you out. So the best thing to do with sin is to confess it and forsake it fast. 
Now, the Bible says if you say you have no sin, now you're lying. So all of us have sin, have to contend with sin, but don't coddle your sin. Don't try to rationalize your sin. Don't try to justify your sin. Don't try to make a special deal with God. You're going you're gonna to make some special arrangements outside of the Bible, so the Lord's going to make a special deal with you. You're fooling yourself. Solomon went outside the boundaries. And Solomon led Israel in the national sin of idolatry. The Bible says on the Solomon chapter 11 and verse uh, 5, so Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Malcolm and the abominations of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then, then did Solomon build high places for Chemosh, the, uh, the abominations of Moab, and in the hills that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abominations of the children of Ammon. And the worship of Molech is like today's, today's abortion, burning the children in the fire to a false god. Solomon ushered in the age of diversity and tolerance and an equal religion, an equal view of all religions as an equal and separate path to the same God. Solomon was the tolerant diversity king. His, his daddy was conservative. His daddy served Yahweh only. He was not a perfect man, but he served Yahweh only. David never served a false god. God called David a man after his own heart. But his son, you know what he did? See, he, he, he thought that he could outwit his father. He married all of these wives. These were diplomatic moves. These were, these weren't, he didn't marry them for, he didn't fall in love with all of them. He married them because when the kings made treaties with other nations, among the things that they did was they married into those royal families. So Solomon married and to the point where he had 700 wives, 700 wives and princes, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. This is in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 3. So he uh, thought that this would build his alliance. But with those wives came their religions, came their gods. This is why the Bible teaches that we're to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You need to marry someone that you have things in common with. First and foremost is, as a believer, you, should, you shouldn't even consider a person who doesn't love the Lord. Mm -mm. You love church, but you're going to marry somebody who don't like church. Half comes to church. They're only showing up, and, and girls fall for this, and occasionally you get a blockhead guy to half come to church, because he want to marry you. Now, you know, he's, you know he's not interested. You know he's not interested. You've you never seen him shout. Never seen him get happy. The Holy Ghost move all over the service. He's just sitting there. Doesn't get involved in the service. Doesn't say amen. Act like he has no emotion. Go with him to the game. Loudest one in the pews. Go with him to the movies. Oh, he's got emotion, all right. Because he's all over you. When the move is over, he had not seen a thing. Said, well, don't even know the name of it. There you go. Uh, Save. Has no interest for the Lord, and then you marry them. 
then what comes with that man is their God. Secularism. No interest for Jesus. They don't believe in tithing. They don't believe in giving. It all comes out. You know the guy didn't like the pastor when you married him. You knew he had, you know, he's all right. Then it all comes out. And you know what happens? He turns your heart. He turns your heart. Say what you will or may. It's easy to serve the Lord, marry to somebody who loves the Lord like you do. Than it is to serve the Lord, marry to somebody who don't love the Lord. Your best day, my sister, your worst day alone, unmarried, is better than your best day married to a man who don't love the Lord and don't love you. I just quoted a prophetess, Janet Floyd, a single uh, woman. She's on her, on her own law firm. She's a pastor. She's a prophetess. She, she's a world-renowned speaker, and she's never been married. So before you say it's easy for you to say that because you've been married almost 40 years, I quoted someone who's been single all their life. And, uh, and, and we'll go to, go to heaven single unless the Lord sends the right person. But she needs somebody who loves the Lord the way she loved the Lord. There has to be some agreement. You don't marry, no, you don't marry someone and you're wondering. You're not quite sure of her sexuality. You're not quite sure of his sexuality. Walk away. No, don't walk away. Run away. Run away, because it ain't going to work. Now, you, now, college students and visitors, if you've never heard me before, I know I'm a little hard-hitting. I was, uh, when I was at Portsmouth, I was preaching on another subject, and I spoke to the young, one young lady after service. She, she loved the Lord, but she struggled so hard with some of the things I had to say, because I, I let the hammer down, and I told her after service, I said, that's the way God's truth is. God says, it's not my word like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. I told you I come to preach to you. I didn't come to share with you. I hadn't been mollified. Amen. Amen. So he marries these women. They turn his heart, and God gets angry. Chapter 11, 1 Kings, verse 9 says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he, Solomon, kept not that which the Lord commanded. So God judged him. Verse 14 of the same chapter says, And the Lord stirred up, an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. And he was of the king's seed in Edom. You know, the children of Edom and the uh, Israelis has a common ancestry for the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. And they were a strong, mountainous people. After Solomon died, are you following me? His son, Rehoboam, chapter 11, verse 43 says, And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried. You know, that's, that's something right there. You read that over and over in the Bible. And was buried. And was buried. And was buried. You cremation people, and was buried. And was buried. He slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. 
And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Chapter 12, are you following me? And Rehoboam went to seek him. For all Israel were come to seek him, to make him king. And it came to pass when, now I'm going to get ready to introduce someone, when Jeroboam, we're going back to him now, the son of Nebat was yet in Egypt. He heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. Now why did Je was Jeroboam in Egypt. Well, in chapter 11, verse 26 says, And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, a Euphratite of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he, Jeroboam, lifted up his hands against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hands against the king. Solomon built Milo, which was a military outpost, and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. Built up Jerusalem. And the man Jeroboam was, look at this, a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, that is, that Jeroboam could get things done. Some people are talkers. Jeroboam was a doer. He could get things done, and he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Perhaps had Solomon not been caught up in idolatry, he wouldn't have taken an industrious man who had lifted his hands against him and made him and appointed him. It's never good to reward iniquity. You reward, you get more of what you reward. Amen. And it came to pass that at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, Follow me now, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. And he, uh, Jeroboam, had clad himself in a new garment. He just got, him a, got a raise. He's been elevated. He has money. And he has rank. And they, too, were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. In this day and time, that would have been a bad fight. The prophet grabbed his garment and ripped it in 12 pieces, and he said to Jeroboam, Take the 10 pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes. But he shall have the one tribe, that is Judah, and, and that doesn't count the, the other tribe, the Levites, Benjamin, for my servant David's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. And why is God going to take 10 of the 12? Because that they have forsaken me. Be careful, America, as you line up to vote for a man who's married to a man. Be careful as we celebrate guys like Dwayne Wade who is a child abuser. Any man that raises a 12-year-old boy as a girl, there's something wrong with him. That's abuse. Say what you want to. 
that's abuse. It's abuse. If words still have meanings, it's abuse. Abuse is abnormal use. It is abnormal to raise a 12-year-old boy as a girl. That's wrong. Be careful as we line up and throw our support behind those who promote the customs of Molech and the blood of millions of unborn babies are on our hands. Be careful as we endorse other religions. This country shows more uh, respect. I've said this before. I lost a member behind it. But I'll say it again. America shows more respect to the religion of our enemies than it does to the religion that made this country great. Hollywood won't, won't make movies saying anything disparaging about Muhammad. They're not going to criticize Muslims. Most of the time when they show them on, on shows, they are portrayed as noble, first-rate, sincere people. But look at how the Christian is portrayed. Look at how the name of Jesus is mocked. Look at how the Lord's name is taken in vain. Oh my, look at, our, look at the comedians who built their careers on criticizing the house of God and the saints of God. Be careful how you do these things. God said, because they have forsaken me. I'm going to preach in just a moment. And have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Malcolm, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes. My brothers and sisters who are darker than blue, be careful as we embrace these strange offshoot religions. Am I saying it right, the comedic? I don't even, I don't even stand, understand what's even attractive about trying to serve a God that represents an ancient Egyptian system. Didn't you read where God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? <laughs> Haven't you read where the Lord conquered all of the gods of Egypt? Each plague represented an Egyptian god, and Yahweh proved to be greater. Don't you know your history? It was the God of the Bible who brought us out of slavery and kept us during that time and yet many of us now are quick to turn our back on the church and on the Lord be careful God said they wouldn't follow me some of you college students may be saying to yourself I picked the wrong day to come it's the right day you, you need to hear you need to hear a preacher not a sharer you need to hear somebody who's not afraid to tell you the truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Say amen. amen. Now, uh, you have to admit, I'm in the Bible. See, these false gods are just religious by a different name. There's always been false gods. There have always been religious systems in the world, complex, that were older, that predate Judaism. There were false gods before God gave the commandments to Moses. There were false gods and false religions before Jesus came. Why do you think he came? He came to bring light. He didn't come to judge the world. He came to set the world free, to get them out of darkness. Get them out of darkness, to get them out of these false religions and false gods and false ways and point them to the true and living God. And then Jesus declared, no man cometh to the Father but by me. That's the whole point. The point of biblical Christianity is not that there are multiple ways to God. The point of biblical Christianity is that there's one way. 
And Jesus says, I am that way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Here we see that uh, apostasy, diversity, tolerance of all religions got Israel in trouble with God. And the Lord said to, uh, uh, through Ahijah to Jeroboam, I'm going to take the 12 tribes. I'm going to give you 10 of them. He says, but how be it though, uh, verse 34, uh, I will not take the whole kingdom out of Rehoboam's hand, out of Solomon's hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake. Some of us are blessed because God remembered our parents. You had a praying grandmother, praying mother, amen, whom I chose because they, have, they kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand. See, I won't take it. See, Solomon was king when Ahijah spoke to Jeroboam. He says, I'm not going to take it from Solomon, but I'm going to take it from his son. Verse 36, and unto his own, unto his son will I give one tribe that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem. Follow me now. Verse 37, And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desire. I'm going to give you all you want, Jeroboam, and shall be king over Israel. You're going to be king over the northern kingdom. And it shall be, now listen to this, if thou will hearken unto all that I command thee and will walk in, in my ways and do that which is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did. In other words, don't do like Solomon did. He says, that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. And look at this. And I will, and I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Judah's going to suffer, but not forever. So after this happened, somehow the word got back to Solomon. Jeroboam should have kept his mouth shut. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt. And Shekah, king of Egypt, uh -huh, unto him, and was in Egypt until Solomon died. So this is how... Back to our text, this is Jeroboam. And this is why God sent a man from Bethel. Are you following me? Is it making sense to you? Let me tell you what happened. Rehoboam became king. Solomon dies. Rehoboam is king. And uh, they send word. Back to chapter 12, to get, tell uh, Jeroboam that Solomon is dead. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation, they all, uh, all of Israel came to, to, to speak unto Rehoboam. Remember in verse 1 of chapter 12, you Bible students, Rehoboam summons the people to Shechem for him to be made king. The, some of them summoned Jeroboam, come out of Egypt, and let's uh, go and behold the coronation. And they said, now, 
we're going to talk with him because Solomon was great, but Solomon, uh, he made our yoke grievous, according to verse 4. And, and, uh, and the congregation said to, to Rehoboam, thy father, verse 4, made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou uh, the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, <clears throat> which he had put upon us. They said, lighten the load. Said, your daddy built that temple. It, it was beautiful, but man liked to tax us to death. And his mansion and all that. I mean, it was something. But they said, he's gone now. Now that you're king, um, lighten the load a little bit. Because, because, because number one, you just got in it. So you don't have the weight that your father had. You, you, you've just been appointed. So why not cut taxes? Say amen. amen. Why not give us a break? Give us some tax relief. Let us keep more of our own money that we've earned in our own pocket. And uh, Rehoboam, I won't read this part, but you can read it when you get home, met with his father's administration, his father's counselors, and said uh, to the people, he sent the people away, said, give me three days, and I'll give you my answer. So he met with his father's administration and his dad's advisors. Can you see him sitting around the table? Said to him, sir, uh, the king, Rehoboam, uh, uh, that, that's, some, that's some truth to what they said. Your dad was great, but, but his, the load was heavy. Give the people relief. Cut taxes. Give them a break. Slow down some of these building projects. Let the people live, and they'll serve you. Forever. All right. After he heard from the his father's camp, he met with his own buddies, his boys, his crowd. See, he lived in a bubble. That was a he remember he was Solomon's son. So he, he always had an entourage around him. He always had people around him telling him how great he was whether they meant it or not, because it wasn't in your best interest not to tell him he was great. So he met with those guys, and you know what they said to him? They said, they said you could tell they had never led. They said, you should double the load. You tell them if you think that my dad was rough, it'll be just like one of my fingers. I am going to put it on you. And all just be as condescending to them as you can. And do you not know that that is what he did? The people came back three days later. He said, I heard what y'all said, but I'm not going to do any of that. And he said, verse 11, and now whereas my father did lay, lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father have chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scorpions. A fool if there ever been one. And so when he said this, verse 12 says, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, and, uh, and he spoke roughly to them, and, the, and, the, and the, here's how it ended. Verse 16 says, so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look at this. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto that tent. That is, they said, let David 
take care of himself. We're gone. And the people left him. And they formed, they almost had a civil war. The ten tribes and the two tribes. Are you following me? This kind of preaching is good for those who love the Bible. It's boring to those who don't. They almost had a civil war. If you read in verse 21 and down. And there was a prophet, a man of God named Shemiah. He came and he spoke up. And he told them not to fight. And said this division is of the Lord. So now the kingdom splits. Jeroboam is now King Jeroboam. He goes from being a fugitive in Egypt to king over the northern kingdom. Rehoboam is King Rehoboam with two tribes. Whereas he, when he went into office, he had 12. What does Jeroboam do? Power will ruin you. Because see, one of the things that power makes you do is that it makes you think too much. And the Bible teaches that you trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Jeroboam began to reason within himself because he knew that there were special feast days, special holidays. They were called holy days. At least three per year that summoned all Jewish males to Jerusalem. He got worried. It's like those who get worried about things that renegade jurisdictions are doing. Why worry? Let them do that. You do what God have called you to do. You keep up with what God is doing. If you keep up with what God is doing, you have to worry about what the devil is doing. The Lord put Jeroboam in office, but Jeroboam chapter 12 verse 26, the Bible says, and Jeroboam said in his heart, uh, beware of the man who keeps his own counsel. Beware when your, your heart becomes its own echo chamber. For all of a man's ways are right in his own eyes. He said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. In other words, I'm getting ready to lose these people. Why did you think that? God have already set you up. If this people go, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord, Solomon's temple, at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again to their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. He began to think self-preservation. He became paranoid. You know what he did? Instead of seeking the Lord who had elevated him. Listen, people. Instead of seeking the Lord who had elevated him. Whereupon, verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel. He listened to the wrong people. Now Jeroboam is making the same mistake Rehoboam made. He took counsel and made, look at this, two calves of gold. He created his own religion. And, set, and said unto them, these two gods that he just made, it is too much said to the people, it is too much for you to go down, to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. They said, you don't have to go to church. Isn't that what's said to many of our people today? Isn't that what's said with these new religious systems? Christianity is a white man's religion. Don't go over there. They're serving a white man's God. Here's a new God for you. The next thing you know, you're out there standing on the side of the road in a winter suit with a bow tie on selling magazines. Serving a false god. I'm a part of the nation of Islam. You better get back in church. You better serve the God of your forefathers, the God who made us great. 
So he made these two gods, self-preservation, and set one in verse 29 in Bethsheba and the other in Dan. That is, he set one at the northern uh, coast and one at the southern coast. And the people began to worship and serve these false gods. And he set up a religious system. Verse 32, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast that is in Judah, that is on the same day in Judah where they're observing oh, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, he sets up an alternative religion. An alternative religion. I'm almost through. And so while they were worshiping, because he didn't want them to go to Jerusalem, for fear they'll fall in love with the Lord and not come back. So he set up an alternative religion. You don't have to set up an alternative religion to make it. You don't have to succeed. You ain't got to become a liar, a whore, a backstabber. You don't have to undercut someone else. If God has something for you, just live holy. If, if God has a husband for you, he ain't going to give you somebody else's. Just live holy. If God has a wife for you, you don't have to steal her from someone else. Just live right. If the Lord has a promotion for you, you don't have to, you don't have to compromise your views to get promoted. Just wait on the Lord. Jeroboam failed to wait on God. And the Lord had set him up. Are you getting something out of this? So while they were worshiping, while they were participating in, in this false religion. Back to the text. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. See, everybody in the northern kingdom under Jeroboam, the Bible teaches that Jeroboam took the worst men, the basest men, the lewd men, and made them priests. Verse 31 of chapter 12 says, And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of people, Woo! which were not of the sons of Levi. Took drunks, liars, cheaters, all kind of low people and consecrated them and made them priests. So you can imagine what kind of worship service they were having with low grade, low people as priests. Bible says, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Am I preaching? Yes. Oh, preacher, you sound harsh. You sound a little judgmental. No, I'm teaching you how to make judgments. This is a highway. When you get saved, God calls you to come up. So they were worshiping, and this man of God walks up in there at uh, Shechem. Down, no, they were in Bethel. So he walks in there uh, in Bethel. While they were having service, while King Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And when the preacher walked in, he didn't say, I just come to worship with you all. He didn't say, I just come to share with you. The Bible says, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, Oh, altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born of the house of David. And let me tell you what his name shall be. His name shall be Josiah. This is, I'm a little flat, Brother uh, Rick. This is Josiah who would be born 300 years later, said a man will be born of the house of David, whose name is Josiah, and unto, unto thee shall he offer, look at this, the priests of the high places that burns incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Other words, he comes in and he intentionally insults their worship. He intentionally disdains their worship and says, all of you priests, you're going to end up being burned
burn up on this altar, in years to come, you will be sacrificed because of your wickedness. And he says, and I'm going to give you a sign. Praise the Lord. Verse 3, a sign. Uh, the, the, look at this. And he gave a sign the same day saying, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out which is the Lord's way of invalidating the altar. He says the altar is going to be torn down and the ashes that are on it are going to be spread out. And it came to pass, follow me now, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, look at this, which he had cried against the altar. Notice Jeroboam, the, the, the preacher didn't come and try to blend in. He interrupted the service and, and cried out. The king got mad and put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. The king stood up and said, y'all get this fool. Get him. And when the king lifted his hands and pointed his hands at the preacher and said, we're going to get this judgmental, self-righteous preacher, the Bible teaches and when he put forth his hand against him, that his hand dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. God froze Jeroboam's hand. Can you imagine? And uh, from, from, what I, uh, from what I can understand, the preacher, when he walked in, brethren, he had no armor bearers. He had no adjutants. He didn't even have, he was like me. He had no amen corner. <laughs> Hallelujah. And yet that man stood alone and said what God said, and he was not intimidated. And when the king rose up and said, get him, God froze. The king's hand. Can I get a witness? Oh, my. And, uh, and look at this. When God, uh, are you praying for me, froze his hand, the Bible says, look at this. Here's the sign. And the altar was rent. And the ashes poured out according to the sign which the man of God said. He says, the sign that I'm telling you the truth, that's what's going to happen in Josiah's day, is that this altar is going to be turned over. Right before their eyes. The king standing there with his arm frozen. None of his men moving. None of his soldiers, none of the temple guards attacking the man of God. The altar flies open. The ashes uh, spills out, which invalidates their whole worship service. And uh, now you just saw the first step of uh, the attempt to mollify him is that the king tried to hurt him. He tried to silence him. He tried to send soldiers. He tried to kill him. But God froze his hand. God turned the altar open, over. Now watch this. And look at this. And uh, uh, verse 6 says, And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Oh, oh, where's your boldness now, Jeroboam? Entreat now. The face of the Lord thy God. Please pray, 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 pray for me. Pray for me that my hand may be restored again. Pray for me. Pray for me, man of God. And the man of God sought the Lord. And the king's hand was restored again. And it became as it was before. So now God have placed his approval on this preacher. It shows that his arm didn't freeze. Uh, it wasn't a coincidence. It shows that the altar wasn't just poured out. It, didn't, it wasn't happenstance. It wasn't serendipity. It was the hand of God. And so now, look at what the king says. Here's mollification. And, uh, and verse 7, And the king said unto the man of God, 
Come home with me. Come home with me. Be careful where you're invited. Be careful where you're seen. Come home with me. Theologians argue whether or not the king was speaking of his residence, which wasn't good, or the house of his faith, of, a, of the false god. In other words, I need, you know what Jeroboam knew, understood? He understood visuals. We need to look like we're fellowshipping. We need to look like we're on the same team. So he says to him, come home with me. See, some of y'all, you want to look like the world. Oh, you want you want to you want to you you want to you want to identify with them too. Said, "Come home with me, come, come." And and notice this. He says, "Come home with me." And uh, uh, are you praying for me? And he says, "And not only that, come home with me, and 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 not only, and, and refresh thyself." And then he really tried to mollify. And I will give you a reward. He tried to enhance him with money. With, in other words, I need to get this prophet to look like he's endorsing me. Because let me tell you something, saints. You cannot crowd against a platform that you're standing on. You can't preach against what you allow. You, you preachers who crowd against homosexuality and and LBGT, but you got a choir full of sisters. Your word has no power. You got a homosexual on your organ, and a, and a, and a, and a lesbian playing the drums. Your your word has no power. See, for you cannot you cannot cry out against the thing and endorse it at the same time. You either you either on the Lord's side or you're not. You either pro or you con. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I can't, I'm not going to preach against abortion and then vote for somebody who's for it. What kind of sense does that make? That makes no sense at all. I'm not going to be for what I'm against. The Bible said the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The king said, come home. Let me refresh you. You know what kind of signal that would have sent to the rest of the worshipers there in Bethel if the prophet would have been would have gone home and then as he's being refreshed and being fed, he's being mollified. His 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 desire, his willingness to preach against it, oh, to cry loud and spare not is being softened by the dainties and by the, the that good heart bath. And that oh, you're all in the palace, and you can see all of that stuff. You know, oh, the world knows how to entice you. They know how to entice you. Come, come, go with me. Come on over to my place, and you walk in, and you see all of the trappings of sin. Y'all don't hear me, and uh, but you know what the preacher said, and the verse eight said, and the man of God said to the king, if thou gave me half of thine house. I will not go with thee, neither will I eat thy bread, and I'm not going to drink your water. Why? For, uh, for so it was charged me by the Lord, saying, eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went home another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. God said, when you go down there, don't eat that food. See, some of you, the world is enticing you because you're eating that food. You like what they have to offer. It agrees with you. The Bible never said that sin wouldn't agree with you. Dr. Bob Arnott, Years ago, I was watching him judge, and he was trying to prove that Christian men were hypocrites. And that Christian men were hypocrites uh, beyond unsaved men. He says, he cites a study. I don't know if they actually did it, but he cites it. And he said, the studies show that men who watch porn on a regular basis were not moved as much sexually. I don't know how they determined it by the pornographic images 
as the Christian men were moved when they were shown the pornographic images. So he said that shows you that the Christian men are hypocrites because they were aroused more than the men who watch it all the time. That didn't show that Christian men were hypocrites because the Christian men never claim that a, a naked woman is not attractive to look at. Right. Praise the Lord. They, they never said that to see something like that doesn't, doesn't move you. That's not our claim. God says it's wrong. That's the claim. There's a whole lot of sin that you like, but you stay out of it because it's wrong. That's good preaching right there. That's good preaching. There's a whole lot of things we would do if God didn't say it was wrong. There's a whole lot of places we go if God didn't say that it was wrong. There's a whole lot of decisions we'd make if the Lord didn't say that it was wrong. But because God says it's wrong, even if our own flesh craves it. Matter of fact, let me help you. The Bible says so. The Bible says the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and these two are contrary one to another so that you will not do the things that you would. A man's spirit, a man's flesh lusts against his born again spirit. His spirit is saved. His flesh is not. And there's always, praise the Lord, a part of that man that says do wrong. But thank God he listens to the, the, the Holy Ghost in him that says do right. We don't claim, we don't claim to be uh, impervious to sin. Matter of fact, the men who get in trouble are the ones who claim that. That's what the Bible says. The Bible said, let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed lest he fall. See, the guy who's going to get his head knocked off is the guy who's under the impression that, oh, I'm so saved that there are some things I won't do, can't do, shall never do, won't fall for. Yo, know, I would never do it. He's the first one to fall. Man told me one time, Early in my saved walk, he said to me, he said, preacher, bring me up, Rick. I got to, I got to go home now. They're getting bored. He said, preacher, if I was in a room full of naked women, he said, I would not have sex with any of them. Turns out it didn't take a room full. He ended up falling for one. <laughs> See, he, he, he gave himself too much credit. The Bible said, flee fornication. You got to know how to keep yourself out of certain places. Young folk, young ladies, tell the boy at a certain, uh, a certain hour to leave the dorm. Oh, we just getting ready to, to, to study the Bible. No, you getting ready to become a Bible story. Leave that thing alone. Go send him home. Send him home at a certain hour. At a certain hour. God Almighty, and whether you're in college or wherever, that you got to stay. You got to stay holy. That's why you got to keep yourself out of certain situations. Amen, amen, and then we ought to help each other live holy. Help him. I said to someone one day, a young man loves you, he's dating you, help him stay saved. Help him make it until you get married. Don't let that dress be too tight. Don't let the clothes be too revealing. Because if he's a regular guy, he already loves you. If he's a regular guy, a regular man wants a woman. He, amen. He, he's always rebuking the devil. He's rebuking self. He's rebuking his own mind because ain't nothing wrong with him. The woman was made for the man. So you got that. Oh, y'all don't hear me preaching. Got to help him live holy. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying today. The, God said, don't you eat that meat. Don't you drink that water. Don't eat that bread because if you eat it, if you eat it, if you eat it, it'll get in you. If you eat it, it'll affect you. If you let it get in you, it'll mess with you. Praise the Lord. If you let it get in you, it'll mess with you. Be careful. Praise the Lord on what you order off of iTunes. Be careful what you download. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful. But praise the Lord as you do your head shake and check your nails. Be careful because the devil will cause you to go to hell. You better watch what I'm saying here. The devil will destroy you which he wants to get in and you can't let him in if you let him ride he'll try to drive are you with me today so the preacher says no 
and he goes another way. I wish I could close this sermon on the mountaintop. I wish I could close it with a big hoop. But that ain't how it ends. The Bible says, and there dwelt, listen, listen, and there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. Now, when I let the inexperienced of the youth have it, the, old, the, the older saints said, amen. Young folk, y'all ought to get revenge now. It was an old prophet. Been in the way a long time. Been in the church a long time. Experience. I said an old prophet. Sometimes when the devil comes, it ain't somebody that's young. Sometimes it's somebody old and call you off to the side. I don't care what Bishop Wooden said. Live your life. Sow your oats. Don't let these people fool you. Be careful. A whole lot of young folk have gone astray, sitting around listening to old people, old position holders, old folk saying things that they ought not to say. And you know, you know why you're saying it. You know why you're saying it, that you are using your influence to put a, a wedge between your that young person that's listening to you, it may or may not be a family member. You know why you're saying it. You are manipulating them. You know out of their respect for you, you're using the respect that the church gave you. Because I endorsed you. If you're anything in this church, I appointed you. You're using the respect that I gave you to poison that young mind. The Bible said it was an old prophet. I tried to figure out, John, how, how I could swing this one to just close out strong. The Lord said, the Lord said you can't do it. He said, bring it down. All you who, who are in positions who, who have influence, it was an old prophet. In Bethel, in the same place where the preacher had just preached. And his sons came and told him all the words of the man of God. What the man of God had said that day in Bethel. And the words that he had spoken unto the king. He was too much for Jeroboam. Then they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, the old prophet. Which way did he go? Where did he go? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said to his sons, saddle me the ass. And they saddled him, and he rode thereon and went after the man of God and found the man of God sitting under an oak. Sometimes you got to be careful when you take a break. Perhaps the guy wouldn't have caught up to him. God said, when you do finish your assignment, go back. Don't go the way I came. Go home. He decided to sit under an oak. While sitting there, he didn't know his enemy was catching up with him. Didn't know that he was being pursued. This is preached each Sunday. And while sitting under an oak, are you following me? He said unto him, the old man, art thou the man of God that cameth from Judah? And he said, I am. Then said he unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Come
come with me. And he said unto him, the preacher, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. See, he, he didn't, he shouldn't have stopped. Notice, notice what he said. He said, I can't eat with you in this place. See, he was still in the northern kingdom. See, some of y'all, you, you, you hadn't come all the way out yet. See, you say you're sanctified and almost feel. You've stopped. You got to come out. All the way out. You, you praise the Lord, you got to come out. Well, I'm not quite sure whether I'm commit, ready to commit to the Lord to that degree. The, the old man is catching you. While, you. while you're dragging your feet, he's riding on his horse. He, he's racing towards you. While you are moving like a snail. Praise the Lord. He said, I can't eat in this place. That means he had not gotten back to Judah. That means he stopped when he should. Oh, God, give me strength not to stop. God, give me the power I need to keep going. For it was said unto me, he says to the old man, by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink any water, nor return again and go the way that thou camest. God told me not to. Then he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. I'm a prophet too. I'm just as much of a prophet as you are. And he was a senior citizen. So you, you're responsible. Let me tell you something, you seniors. You're responsible for the respect that that gray hair gives you. You're responsible for the, res the, the respect that years of having been here gives you. You're, re you're responsible for your title, for your position in this church. You're responsible because it gives you influence. And with influence comes responsibility to toe the line. You don't want nobody keeping your children who undermine you. I don't do that with my grandparents, with my grandbabies. When they ask me something, I say, let me find out if it's all right with your parents. I ain't going to do nothing to say. And then that's different from what their parents tell them. And then tell them, don't tell your parents. I'm undermined. And there ain't no cute way to undermine. It sends the wrong thing. I'm preaching too long. So this prophet says, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet as thou art. And the angel of the Lord spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee in thine house that he may eat bread and drink water. Now, Pastor, how do you know that the Lord didn't speak to the old prophet? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says, but he lied to him. He lied to him. But notice, he was able to tell a lie so convincingly that the lie sound like the truth. Look at how they're lying to us today. God made them male and female. Anybody tell you any different? They're lying. Marriage is a union between a man and a woman. Anybody tell you any different? They're lying. Liars. If a man don't work, neither shall he eat. Anybody tell you any different? They're lying. Liars. Don't you be lied out of, don't you get lied out of your place in the kingdom. You let nobody lie you, uh, to, uh, lie to you and take your anointing. The man lied. The man lied. 
and look at what happened. It gets sad. I, I wish I could close it. Uh, but there, there's a whole lot of messages online where I close high. And, and, and look at this. And, he came, and it came to pass. No, no, verse 19. So he went back. When I read this, it brings tears to my eyes. He went back with him. And look at this. And did eat bread in his house. And did drink. Even though God had told him not to do it. He let, the politician couldn't get him, but he let his fellow religious leader get him. Be careful of those who try to get you to do wrong in the name of the Lord. All through the Obama years, every time I would cry out against something that the president was doing that was against God, all of my Friends, them old prophets, would say what Wooden doesn't understand is that you got to separate your religion from your politics. That's a lie. Not just under Obama. Some of them are mad because I'd said under the current president, that's all this cussing and stuff. I said, that is not good. It has contributed to the moral decline in our uh, communication. There are those who, well, you shouldn't say that. What do you mean I shouldn't? Ain't nobody's hand in my pocket. I seek no favor. I never have. The man's policies are right. He's he going to get my support. But in terms of holiness, Yeah, people, don't you, you beware of those who try to lead you astray in the name of the Lord. This man came to him in the name of the Lord. And the preacher sat there and he ate and he drank. Let me wrap it up. Let me wrap it up. And it came to pass as they sat at the table. Look at this. Look at this. That the word of the Lord came to the prophet that brought him back. The old man, God's word, came to the old prophet. Here's what the old prophet said to the young prophet. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, after the guy was full, was good? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Are you refreshed? Yes. He said, all right, yes. You enjoy yourself? Yes. Then he said, thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but thou, but camest back and haste and has eaten bread and drank water in the place which the Lord thy God told thee not to do. Well, he told you, eat no bread, drink no water. He said, because you disobeyed God, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy father. Can you imagine how he, he had to feel? This is the same man. The same man who talked him into it. Now says, you're going to die. And it came to pass. After he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled, look at this, the old prophet saddled for him, the ass. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you a, a Uber. <laughs> Taxi! So you got, you got to go now. Mission accomplished. Got to go now. You got to go. 
says, uh, for the prophet whom he had brought back and put him on the animal and said, goodbye. <laughs> the Bible says, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. He allowed himself to become mollified. When he went to the old prophet's house, the old prophet was not a prophet of the Lord. He lived in Bethel. He was a prophet, one of Jeroboam. Remember I told you, Jeroboam appointed, Jeroboam appointed the lowest. So when God's prophet was at Jeroboam's prophet's church, worshiping with him, eating at his table. In doing that, he validated that false religion. Hence, he mollified the preacher. And once the devil, once God's servant represents Satan and the world, then God's servant cannot shine the light. Cannot represent the Lord. I don't want this to happen to me. I don't think that I'm so saved and so strong that it can't happen to me. That was his problem. So therefore, I want the Lord to keep me. I want the Lord to give me eyes to see. And ears to hear. I want the Lord to make me wise. So that when the enemy comes. Whether he comes disguised as King Jeroboam. Has a, a, a fancy worship system. Or come disguised as an old prophet of God. That I have the spirit of discernment. And not be drawn away by the world. Some of you are being enticed. You've been in, they pulled you in because you want what you want. The world knows how to get you incrementally. Well, well, preacher, I haven't done any of those wicked things. You don't have to do it if you're standing there, if you're with them, if you're in the photograph. It is as, it is, it is as though you've done it. For when people see you, the assumption is that's who you're with now. You cannot run with the devil's crowd and run with God's crowd. One day I was at a national meeting waiting to get a ride. I was catching a courtesy car. And a man pulled up in the car dressed uh, like a woman and wanted to know if I wanted a ride. Oh, no, I didn't want no ride. I ain't got nowhere to go. Mm. Mm -mm. Do you know the damage that can be done just being seen dropped off with that kind of driver? Well, don't the Bible say judge not? It does. But you're saying that you're judging me right now. So people are going to do that. So you have to know how to not allow yourself to be tricked. And then you take the world's goodies and all of a sudden, Sin is not as sinful anymore. Your stance is not as strong. Your, your punch, your hit is not as powerful as it used to be. You've been mollified. I've seen mollified church mothers, mollified pastors, mollified bishops, mollified singers. What do you think the voice and, the, and American Idol and all that's all about? They, they pull in all of our singers, put them on that platform, and then say, sing the world songs. And you got to praise them because you want to get to Hollywood. You got to do what they tell you because you want to get to the next round. 
so you sell out. Then, then once you lose, then you try to come back to the church, but they mollified you. It takes a minute to rebuild. I want to pray today. I've been up long. But, you know, God said, speak to him. Warn the people. See, the Bible is a, is a true book. That's why every story doesn't end, and they live happily ever after. Preacher, I want you to pray for me that I not be mollified, that I am wise enough to recognize the devil's plots and plans and the things that Satan tries to do to it. The word I'm searching for is the devil's enticements. He'll, he'll entice you if you want prayer for this. Meet me at the altar. The young and the old. I don't want to be enticed. Come to the altar. I want to pray a simple prayer. I don't want to end up being lion's food. I'm, I'm away from home for the first time. I'm on the college campus. It's a new world. Everything's new. It's big, it's bold, it's brash. I work in this industry, I work in that industry. Bethel, Jeroboam, that false religious system is all around me. I can't get around it. How do I stay saved in the midst of it? God gives you wisdom. God gives you power. God shows you where to go and where not to go. What, what platform to be seen on and what platform to avoid so as to not allow your name and reputation to be brought down to keep you from being mollified. Once you've been mollified, you're no longer qualified. And you're no good if you can't say what God would have you to say. Lift your hands. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you. We're challenged with the world's enticements. The world is saying, in one form or another, come, dine with me, eat my bread, drink my water. Let me bathe you. Let me refresh you. And Lord, we said no, but the world has different ways. The devil comes one way, then he'll come another way. God, give us wisdom to recognize even the old prophet. Give us the strength to keep walking. To stay on the journey. Had he not stopped. Had he not stopped. The devil would not have been successful. Had he just left. Even if he wouldn't have gotten all the way home. Just gotten out of the territory of the northern kingdom. Anywhere in Judah. He could have eaten. Anywhere. In the northern kingdom, they could have dined together and judgment would not have come. And Satan caught him. Oh God, give us power to keep running, to stay in church, to stay interested in the things of God. Thank you. Give us power to stay on fire for Jesus, to hold on to the altar, 
to keep the fire burning. My God, as the years roll on, may we keep our fire as life happens and even as we suffer losses and different things. God, keep us fired up. God, give us strength to stay on fire for the Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. Give us the fervency as the years roll by. May our strength not be abated. May our zeal not lessen, but give us power, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, to get stronger as the day go by. Hallelujah, Jesus, to get stronger as the day go by, as the years roll on. Hallelujah. Let us grow up and to be more committed in the name of Jesus. Woo, Lord, give us strength to serve you in a day like today in the name of Jesus. And whether the devil come through politics whether the devil comes through, hallelujah, religion, however the devil comes, whether it's somebody young, like Rehoboam's advisors, or someone old, like this old prophet, God give us the strength to get in the word and stay there, to stay there, to stay with God's truth, to stand on the word of God, to stand on the scriptures in the name of Jesus. Now we rebuke you, Satan. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. And the hand of God is against you. And we speak deliverance. We speak power. We speak change of mind. We speak change of heart. Let the Lord turn your mind. Let him turn your way from the advice of that old prophet. Who is the old prophet? They don't have to be old in age. Just if, they, if the advice is against God, if the advice is contrary to what the Bible says, then that's that old prophet. Don't listen to them. They'll get you eaten by a lion. You'll lose out. But if you just stay with the law, The Lord will keep you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With your hands lifted on the altar. I hear the Lord. I hear the Lord. Yield not to temptation. For yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully on what dark passions subdue. No giver to Jesus. He will carry you through. You just ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep. He's willing to aid you. Jesus will carry you through. One more time, just ask the Savior to help you comfort, strengthen, and, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. Jesus will carry you through.